Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I want to give some love to the other half of NASA's Commercial Resupply Services Program. The Antares rocket by Orbital Sciences Corporation now became Orbital ATK, which then became part of Northrop Grumman. But in the early days, this wasn't even in the original Commercial Orbital Transportation Services contract. Like, they failed to make the first round cut. And it was only after Rocket Plane Kistler failed to get the funding that they came in in the second round, got the funding to build their rocket, and then became one of the suppliers to the space station alongside SpaceX. The Antares was originally called the Taurus II. If you remember a few weeks ago, I talked about the supplier that had been faking reports that resulted in uh, the fairings not separating on Taurus rockets. Well, that was around the time that these guys were, of course, proposing this launch vehicle. But this is a much bigger and more complicated beast. This early NASA graphic shows that it is smaller than SpaceX's Falcon 9, but that was the Falcon 9 1.0. The current Falcon 9 is taller still, but it does carry a fairly substantial chunk of cargo to the space station on every launch. Now, the rocket was actually put together really relatively quickly by working with overseas partners unlike SpaceX, that produce most of their stuff in-house. The first stage of this is a Ukrainian design derived from the Zenit rocket. The engines are Russian. The booster for the second stage is built by ATK. It's a castor. And of course, the capsule is the Cygnus spacecraft built by Orbital Sciences. ATK and Orbital merge to become Orbital ATK which is, of course, in stark contrast compared to the relationship between Russia and Ukraine these days. Anyway, the heritage of these engines is a story in and of itself. In fact, there is a documentary called Cosmodrome, or the engines that came out of the cold. Either way, these were the engines that were built for the Soviet moon rocket, the N1, and they were way ahead of their time. They were closed-cycle kerosene liquid oxygen engines that developed better thrust-to-weight ratio and higher specific impulse than anything else at the time. Sure, the Saturn V had the F1 engines, which we all know and love, but those are like muscle cars compared to these engines, which are like super sleek, high-tech sports cars. Unfortunately, while the NK-33 engines were ahead of their time, they were mated with the N-1 rocket, which was big and complicated, and with big complicated rockets, even the smallest failure can ruin your entire launch. After four launches, the Soviet Union lost patience, and the project was cancelled. But those engines that had been built... They ended up stored in a warehouse, despite being ordered to destroy them. And so a bargain-minded U.S. aerospace corporation brought them to the U.S. and worked with Aerojet Rocketdyne to develop them for their launch vehicle. And that company wasn't Orbital Sciences, it was Kistler Aerospace who were developing their K-1 rocket. And they were, of course, the early favourite in the commercial orbital transportation services contract. Because SpaceX at that point hadn't launched a rocket and they were just a bunch of newbies that nobody knew anything about. But as I mentioned, Kistler failed to get the funding they needed. Orbital Sciences, I guess, seeing an opportunity, they took those engines for their rocket. And so, on April 21st, 2013, the first launch of an Antares rocket went ahead. It wasn't carrying a Cygnus, but it did carry a mass simulator to show that they could launch the payload into orbit. It also carried three small CubeSats, which were actually modified Android phones. The three satellites were named Alexander, Graham and Bell. They stayed in orbit for about a week and amateurs were able to talk to them all over the world. They even got some pictures out of them, which is kind of cool. Anyway, this is stage separation. The upper stage isn't really quite as storied as the first stage. It uses a Castor 30 solid rocket motor, which has engine gimballing. And the, the 30 in the Castor 30 references the fact that it weighs about 30,000 pounds, or 14 tons if you speak metric. So having demonstrated that the Antares rocket could carry the Cygnus into low Earth orbit, they then got their permission to actually try a launch to the space station, and that happened in September of 2013. The Cygnus was called the G. David Lowe, after George David Lowe, who was an astronaut, uh, and they successfully rendezvoused. And following that, they began regular service to the space station. 
launching their first uh, proper launch in January, a second launch in July of 2014, and then in October of 2014, things didn't go quite as they expected. A few seconds into the launch, the turbo pump on one of the engines disintegrated, the engine stopped and the whole thing fell back to the ground, essentially being fully fueled. It was one of the most spectacular rocket failures ever witnessed in the US. This failure was pretty high profile and many of you probably recognise that fireball even if you didn't know it was the Antares rocket. And you might also be surprised to know that one of the satellites that was on that spacecraft was recovered afterwards and they actually displayed it. They showed me it when I visited Planet Labs in San Francisco a few years ago. And so as the smoke cleared and the damage became evident, Orbital ATK went back to the drawing board and started looking for new engines. And they found more Russian engines. And it turned out the best option they had was a Russian engine. This is the Zenit rocket, which is closely related to the first stage of the Antares. It's built by the same people. And this is mated with a Russian RD-171 engine. The Zenit originally began as a strap-on booster for the Energia rocket. And of course, the team would have already had experience working with the Russian engines, therefore it was kind of logical for them to continue working with Russian engines at this point. So the new 200 series Antares design would use the RD-181, which is the single chamber version of the RD-171. They all share the same turbo pump assembly. Also, this makes it closely related to the first stage of the Atlas V, which uses an RD-180. The difference is that this is two separate engines, whereas the Atlas V uses one engine with two separate exhausts. They also used the Atlas V to launch the Cygnus spacecraft when the Antares was grounded, so that they could continue with their commercial supply contracts. Orbital ATK had been naming their Cygnus spacecraft and this one was called Deke Slayton 2 because of course the original Deke Slayton had been destroyed. Almost two years later in October of 2016 Antares was once again launching, this time equipped with its new enhanced engines. And as of April 17th, it has now flown five missions with the new configuration, as opposed to four missions and one big explosion with the previous configuration. And it will likely continue many more launches because Orbital ATK, now Northrop Grumman, they got the contract for CRS-2, so they will continue launching to the space station with the Antares. But at this point, it hasn't had any other customers. All 10 launches have been related to the commercial supply program for the space station. But there are still developments planned for the rocket. Because the engines are too powerful for the size of rocket, they actually have to underthrottle the engines, which actually reduces their specific impulse. The reason why they have to underthrottle it is because the structure of the rocket has to handle the loads, the accelerations. So they're actually upgrading the rocket to make it stronger so they can handle this, so that they will be able to run those engines at full power for longer, and therefore be able to get more mass into space. And that's probably a good sign because the Cygnus has, I think, the most internal volume of any of the cargo spacecraft that's been you know, taking stuff to the space station. It hasn't, it doesn't have the ability to return cargo to the surface like the Dragon does, but the Dragon has consistently had issues with you know, being able to handle the load but not having the space to put all the cargo on board. The Cygnus also is one of the ways they dispose of garbage on the space station. They'll put all the trash into that and then have it deorbit and burn up in the atmosphere. And now I think about things burning in the atmosphere, I remember that Antares doesn't launch from Florida, it launches from the Wallops flight facility, which is in Virginia. So if you're on the east coast and you're further up north, you're far more likely to see an Antares launch than you are to see a launch out of uh, the Cape. So just remember that while SpaceX is still getting all the press, they're not the only private commercial space company that is sending payloads to the space station. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.